All right, guys, so I'm recording this. Um, announcements, real quick. Soup and cereal. Make sure the ladies know they're not in the room yet. Yeah, yeah, I see you right there. And you're here, Susan, and that's what matters. I'm partly being facetious, partly not. Guys, soup and cereal, as you've all known, explored, discovered, and enjoyed, we're back to bringing soup and cereal on Tuesday nights. My only request is we don't abuse it because it is a privilege. If it starts getting really messy and nasty, like I don't mind cleaning up a little bit, but I don't want to clean up a pigsty, seriously. So please respect that. It's a privilege to have that. But I want to say, since you know that soup, cereal, granola bars, all that jazz is going to be there, I'm planning on having things open and ready for anyone who wants to come by 5.30. If you want to come by 5.30 or you want to come by 5, I would just ask that you text me and go, Jake, are you there at 5? I'm usually here like from noon up till youth group. I'm here the whole time. I don't leave the building. So if you want to come here like 5, 5.30, do some homework, enjoy some soup and cereal, please do that. Um, ladies, don't forget that Connie and Susan are having a... Lady Shindig here, hanging out, really just hanging out. So please, ladies, wear comfortable clothes, bring your favorite com comfort food dish, doors open at 530, bring and bring a friend. Yes, there's no signups involved. The only cost is time and your heart to want to have fun. And there will be a karaoke machine. So ladies, don't forget, that's this Friday, 530, comfy clothes, bring a comfort food dish, and bring a friend. Also, last but not least, we have these calendars. This one is a little different than what I've had in the past. So the month of October is on a full sheet out there in the hallway where children check in on Sunday. I have just the month of October with more details for what's going on this month. And I've got this quarterly calendar that covers October, November, December. Not as detailed, but kind of gives you an overview as to what events are happening this, well, the rest of this year. Crazy, 2021 is almost over. Um, so please guys, this is getting recorded, bring this home. Before you leave tonight, go in the hallway and grab one of these and an October schedule, okay, or calendar. Make sure you bring it home so your parents have it, okay? Um, and. I said last but not least, well, this is kind of part of the calendar thing. Does anyone know what's happening at the end of this month? Oh, the fall festival. The fall festival. And the theme is, anyone? Trunk or, treat. Trunk or treat. Okay. We're doing a service project, and it doesn't just serve this church fellowship. It also serves the community. And what we're going to do is help set up for this event. And then, if you're interested, Cam, the children's ministry director, is uh, looking for a, a few good men and women who might want to help out with who here wants to be a bouncer? Let's put it that way. I love bouncing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Naomi's like, yeah, I get to throw elbows down. Uh, yeah. Um, we're going to have two bouncy houses and we're definitely going to need some crowd control. Also, we're going to need help with managing parking. So, I have a sign up. I forgot to bring it. October 31st, Sunday, October 31st, right after second service. If you're wondering, when do we do this? Right after second service, we're gonna start with the setup. Lunch is provided, it's free. Cam is uh, bringing pizza, Papa Murphy's. And dinner is provided because in the event, there's a chili cook-off, there's desserts, you're gonna be well fed. The question is, do you wanna care and serve for other people? And our fellowship really needs it. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten really, really good stories from my wife. Not about adults in the fellowship. I'm not here to slander anyone, but honestly, you guys are awesome. And I mean that seriously. You guys have been such a huge support and encouragement to my wife. And you guys have an impact in young kids' lives and in families' lives more than you realize. So please, Sunday, I don't think you'll have anything going on then. Right after second service, help us stick around. We're going to set up. We'll have lunch together, have a good time, enjoy watching kids do crazy stuff. And then afterward, please stick around to tear down, okay? Everyone's like, I can help set up. And then it's always hard to get people to stick around to tear down. So if you sign up, it's to set up and tear down. Many hands make light work. All right, guys, so why don't you turn to Mark chapter two? We're gonna pick up in verse one.
And I'm going to read the first 13 verses. Actually, let's start at verse 44 from Mark 1. You probably shouldn't have to turn a page for that. Anyway, Jesus said to the leper that he healed, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony, a witness to them. But what did the leper do? He went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around. Around where? The Galilee. That's where this is happening. To such an extent that Jesus couldn't any longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. Chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they dug an opening in this, guy, this person's roof. They let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about, whether these, thing, uh, about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say to him, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And Jesus went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. Father, we lift up this word to you tonight. And as you continue to impress to me, if the only reason I open this book is to gain information, or more convictingly, the only reason, the only time, the only reason I plow into this is so that I can create and produce a message for teenagers, and that's it. I have missed it. If we're here just to hear about a good man, um, they can give us good lessons on how to live a good life. We've missed it. Jesus, I pray for all of us, myself at the front of that line, that you would show yourself to us. Spirit of the living God, speak to our hearts. Reveal Jesus to us, that we would know you, not know about you. Help us to go beyond the superficial information that we've heard from others or, or we know other people believe. Help us to get to you. Like these four men who brought their friend, these four men who brought their paralytic friend, they stopped at nothing to bring him to you. Lord Jesus, would you bring us into your presence? that we would not just read these words, but that we would hear your heart speak to ours. We lift this up to you, God, and trust that what you have intended your word for tonight will have its effect. We just ask, Lord Jesus, come and speak to us, teach us in your name, amen. So, Mark chapter two, verse one, we're gonna start back there. But <clears throat> last week, we read how Jesus began his ministry in, according to Mark's gospel. Jesus' ministry revolved around the Galilee. The Galilee. When I say the Galilee, what do you guys think of? Where's the Galilee? The sea. The sea. The Sea of Galilee. It's literally a giant lake, freshwater lake. But they call it the Sea of Galilee because the lake has behavior like a sea. Storms would come upon it still to this day. And it acts more like a sea than a normal lake. But yeah, Jesus' ministry revolved around the Sea of Galilee. And that is actually a fulfillment of prophecy that was given 700 years before Jesus was born in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Now, ending Mark chapter 1, Jesus' popularity, as we've seen, is exploding. Okay, His popularity ratings are through the roof. 
So much so that it is nearly impossible, actually it says, to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. So it's not that he won't enter a city, but now he can't just walk in like anybody else. Okay, remember, this is before social media. This is before cameras. Okay, people don't have a bunch of sketch artists drawing up Jesus's face. And there aren't wanted posters of Jesus. His reputation, who he is, is so prolific already that he can't even walk in without a disguise or undercover and get mobbed. He can't do it. That's how popular he's become. Almost an overnight sensation. What's interesting is Jesus did everything he could to keep a low profile, to conceal his identity during most of his ministry. Why? If Jesus came to reveal himself, if Jesus came to reveal the glory of God, why would he work to keep a low profile? I asked the guys, I don't know if you ladies got to the question, um, is Jesus an enigma? An enigma is something that's mysterious, puzzling, hard to understand. I don't know about you, but I can say over the years, reading the Gospels, there are times, even still, where I go, why would you do that, Jesus? Why are you doing that, Jesus? Why? I don't get it. So <clears throat> here's one explanation. Here's one reason. You got to understand the history of Jesus's time. Israel at the time was anxious, eager. There was a, a fervor growing among the people of Israel to see the prophecy of David's messianic, messianic descendant come to the throne. They know at some point in the future, David's descendant, who is the Messiah, will come to the throne. And when he does, Rome's getting their butt kicked. And not just that, Israel is going to ascend to the chief nation of the world. Israel can't wait to enter their glory days, understandably. But there's a problem. There have been a lot of false messiahs before Jesus, and many more would come after Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus gave as one of the signs of the end of the age, the rise of false prophets and false messiahs, coming saying, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah, I'm the anointed one of God. And here's the enigma of Jesus. Jesus didn't come the way people wanted him. You got to understand Israel, when they read the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, much of the Old Testament prophecies talk about this awesome, righteous king from heaven who comes and waylays the enemy, sets up his throne. Israel's prosperous and protected and at peace like never before. And if you go back and read the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, you and I have chapters, right? That's how the Bible's divided. Well, you'll read a chapter and smack dab in the middle of the chapter, the first half talks about the Messiah in a completely different way than the second half of the chapter. When Jesus showed up the first time, he didn't come riding on a horse. He is going to. We read that in Revelation. The second time, he or the first time, he doesn't come as this <laughs> righteous king with absolute law and power. He comes the way Isaiah 53 promised the Messiah would come. A suffering servant, humble, meek, incredible power, but under incredible control. We see that in Matthew 17. He goes up on what's called the Mount of Transfiguration and three of his guys get to go with him. And in the blink of an eye, they see Jesus the way John sees him in the book of Revelation. Imagine it took more power for Jesus to control and conceal his glory than to show it. Why? None of us act like that. We want credit. When we do something, we want people to know. That's the natural, that's the nature of humanity. We want credit. Credit where credit is due. You've been in a class. You've been in a situation where you throw up your hand for an answer. Or you say the answer and someone else hears it and then they blurt the answer. And the teacher's like, good job. You're like, that was mine. We want credit. What does Jesus do? Conceals his identity. He keeps a low profile. And you will never see Jesus asking the people to glorify him. Never, not once. Because Jesus didn't come for power. 
He didn't come to earn a position. He already knew his position with the Father. Remember Mark chapter 1, verse 11? A voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Jesus didn't need anyone to tell him who he was. He didn't come for position. He didn't come for power. Jesus came to fulfill the gospel. So with that said, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had come back to Capernaum, several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, not at the door, not even near the door. The mob shows up. And what was Jesus doing? Anyone? Hopefully you have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And, and at the end of verse 2, there's not even room for people to be near the door. What does it say Jesus was doing at the end of verse 2? He was what? Speaking. He's speaking to them. You and I are always, we're thinking, oh, well, he's casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead. And that's true. But something that stood out to me throughout chapter 2, chapter 2, we see it start with him speaking to the people. Verse 13, at the end of verse 13, what's he doing? He was teaching them. That seems to be his focus. All these other things are a means to the end for Jesus. After traveling the Galilee, Jesus comes back to Ministry HQ, home base. Where is Ministry HQ? Where's the headquarters for Jesus' ministry? Anyone? Jared. Galilee. The Galilee, and what specific city? It's right there, verse 1. Capernaum. Capernaum. Tomato, tomato. Apparently, some people call it potato. Does anyone believe? <laughs> Naomi's like, what? Bruce Willis? <laughs> Yeah, someone said the potato is actually used by people. I haven't heard it. British people. Huh? British. British people call it potato? Yeah. Wow. I highly doubt any British people are watching this. But if so, you're, yeah, you use your language wrong. America, all the way. Anyway, <laughs> um, if I get a bunch of hate mail, you'll know where it's from. In John chapter 1, verse 44, it says Simon and Andrew were from Bethsaida. John chapter 1, verse 44, it says Simon and Andrew were from Bethsaida. But here, Mark says they're in Capernaum. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Now, I asked the guys this, and um, I'm not sure what you ladies came up with. One of you guys pretty much from the get-go said the right answer. And I asked the question just to get us thinking, because a lot of people in the church have walked away from God because of things like this, something small like this. They're like, wait a minute, if this is really from God, then why does it contradict itself? It's really simple. They were from Bethsaida, which is only six miles, I believe, north of Capernaum. Capernaum is right on the shore. I've been there. It's right there on the shore. Bruce has been there. Bethsaida is just six miles north of that. Some of you, one of you said, well, it could, it could have been that where they lived was kind of on the border between Bethsaida and Capernaum. It is really simple. You know what's funny? Occam's razor. Usually the simplest answer is the right one. They're from Bethsaida and they live in Capernaum. That's not a contradiction any more than Jesus being born in Bethlehem, living in Nazareth is a contradiction. I don't know why I focused on this, but I felt like I needed to address it. Guys, Jesus is from Judea, but he lived in northern Israel, Galilee. They're not a contradiction. Who here has lived in, who here has lived in more than one place? Okay. You're not a contradiction. <laughs> I'm, I was born in San Luis Obispo in the 80s, and then I lived half my life in Bakersfield. But now I live in Anacortes. We move around. These guys started in um, Bethsaida, and then they end up in Capernaum. But what I think is even more interesting are the names of these cities, these towns. And actually, the reason I bring it up is because I was talking with Jeremy yesterday, and he pointed this out, and so we're talking about it, and he had some really good insight. He shared with me, and I looked it up to confirm it, Bethsaida means house of fish or fishing house, which makes sense. Most of the people around the Galilee are involved in the fishing industry. It was one of the major trades. Capernaum, though, is made up of two words, village and comfort. Village of comfort. Comfort village. That sounds nice, like comfort in. 
I don't think I've ever stayed at Comfort Inn. Yeah. Anyway, reel it in, Jake. The word village here, though, is not just, oh, it's a village. A village, especially in the Bible, is a picture of a walled place. And in the ancient world, cities weren't like they are today. Cities in the ancient world were, were walled up. If you wanted to be in a safe place, you wanted to live in the city. Why? Because it's walled. Invaders can't just roam onto your property, rape, burn, and pillage. <gasps> he said pillage. <laughs> So here it is. These guys came from the house of fish or the fishing house, and they end up living in the village of comfort. And here's a quick application. It's interesting, that's where they're from, but now they live in Capernaum, and it's while they're in Capernaum that they meet Jesus, and they start walking with him and doing ministry with him. Drawing near to Jesus, guys, being a part of his mission, takes us from a life of wearying work. And being a fisherman is no easy thing. You guys ought to know if you've lived up here on the islands in the Northwest. Being a fisherman's hard work. Drawing near to Jesus and joining him in his mission takes us from a life of wearying work and settles us into a place that's protected, that gives us comfort. You and I live in the American in the American dream, the American culture. And if people take time off, it must be to do recreation. We don't understand what rest is. If we go on vacation, that means we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. We confuse fun with rest. They're often not the same. But if you're not doing that and you're not working and you're just not doing anything, what do we call that? Anyone? Lazy. Lazy. I would, here's a challenge, go through the Gospels and find times where Jesus wasn't busy doing anything. You and I live in a world where it's work, 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 strive, strive, strive. I remember talking with a family member who doesn't live in this state anymore, and I quote, they said, honestly, I like living here because I like the struggle. And I didn't understand why at the time until I thought later, I'm like, that doesn't even feel right. I don't want to struggle. One, I'm 37 and I got two kids. I got enough of that in my life. But you live in a world that says the way to success is to struggle, strive. The word jihad means struggle, literally. Also submit. Yeah, Some, someone's like, oh, Jake, hate mail, yep. Muslims in England are going to send me hate mail, I guess. Guys, <laughs> Jesus calls you out of your busy life to join him. That doesn't mean life's always going to be easy. Matter of fact, I would say I totally believe following Jesus is one of the most challenging things you can do. And yet at the same time, offer you comfort that you can't get anywhere else. We've seen many people who have major bucks. Great positions in society, very popular, well-liked, loved, and it's never enough because comfort is not found in what you do or in something you achieve. Comfort is found in a person. So look at verse three with me. Jesus is speaking to them. He comes out of the door and there's the whole village and, and, and plus some all standing there waiting with bated breath. What does he do? He speaks to them. But then they came. Some gentlemen came, bringing to Jesus a paralytic, and he's carried by four men. Being unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. By the way, whose house is this? It's Simon Peter's. It's Andrew's. This is their house. Can you imagine someone doing this to your house? We live in the Northwest. You're like, well, it's hot and dry there. Yeah, it's super hot. The last thing you want is the sun baking through your house. Up here, can you imagine someone <laughs> drills a hole through your roof? You're like, no worries. You wanted to come meet Jesus. That's okay. These guys are desperate. Being unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Check this out. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
There's so much we could unpack just from this passage right here. Like verse five, Jesus seeing their faith says, son, your sins are forgiven. Helping out a friend. So have you ever been in a situation where you went to extreme lengths to go help a friend? I mean, you did something that is very abnormal. I'll give you an example of one, one time in my life. Last week, I told you how shameful it was over some of the major faux pas and blunders I've committed in ministry. Tonight, I'm not gonna focus on my mistakes as much. <laughs> There's plenty there. But I remember my brother and I had a friend in college. You're like, oh, that's where this is going. Yeah. We'll call him Paul because that was his name. Anyway, thank you. Paul calls my brother up and I'm watching my brother's expression. He's like, huh, what, where? He's shaking his head, he looks at me. He hangs up. After he says, um, okay, hangs up, he tells me what's up. Paul's downtown in Bakersfield. I think it's 1 a.m. And then he goes, we go in and tell my folks, I got this call from a friend. He's downtown Bakersfield and he's at a nightclub. And to quote my wife, golden boy here, who has never darkened the doorway of a nightclub is like, this is really uncomfortable. He's, he's drunk out of his mind, but he's got enough sense to know he's not where he should be. And he called us for help because he ain't driving himself home. We get there, huh, one, we're finding the address. I never go to this part of Bakersfield at this time of night. We get there, I'm like, ah, oh, this is what the nightlife looks like. Dude, it was so dark, spiritually dark and oppressive, right? Super uncomfortable, interesting characters. My brother and I show up dressed pretty normal. Um, other people there are, well, yeah, dressed differently than we are. And we find the, the entrance and there's people hanging around on the sidewalk. It's funny, at night, the kind of things that law enforcement will let, let happen, but at daytime, this is not allowed. It's pretty interesting, what, what is allowed? We go in and I can feel all eyes are on my brother and I. And we're just looking, where is Paul? Where is Paul? Where is Paul? We're getting interesting looks from girls, interesting looks from guys, interesting looks from everyone for one reason or another. We find Paul and he's out on the dance floor. I won't tell you what he's doing or what he's doing, who he's doing it with. And uh, we got Paul. We finally got him out of the club, stumbling all over. I mean, frankly, we were practically dragging him out because he couldn't walk. And uh, a couple days go by and he'd sobered up and he was so guilty with shame. I've never gone to a nightclub since then. Pray to God I never have to again. Um, fortunately, my brother was the one who got the call. Otherwise I'd have been like, Paul's calling at this hour. I don't know if I can take that right now. Cause I knew Paul and I knew what kind of stuff he struggled with. These guys we read about here are desperate for their friends reputation to be restored. What does Jesus say in verse five? Son, your sins are forgiven. He's a paralytic. Didn't he come to get healed of his paralysis? It doesn't appear that way. And G how do we know this man was in sin? Jesus confirms it. Your sins are forgiven. There is another section in scripture in the gospels where they come across a man who's been crippled since birth. And his disciples ask him, well, why is he like this? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? And he goes, neither. What does he say after that? We'll get there another time. But the point is, this guy is in the shape he's in because of a sinful lifestyle. My friend Paul has suffered a lot of things because of sinful living. Fortunately, he's free from that now. Jesus' response confirms this man's disease, his sickness, was because of his sin. Let me ask you this question. How far will you travel? How much strength will you spend? How uncomfortable are you willing to get to bring family or friends to Jesus? These guys didn't have a car or a train or a plane. 
These guys hiked their friend to this house on a stretcher. Imagine taking a body on a stretcher and climbing up onto the roof. And that's not enough. Now you have to dig through the roof. These guys were desperate to save their friend. Let me ask you this question. How much do you speak to your friends and family about Jesus? We saw here, look at Mark 1, verse 30. Verse 29, Mark 1, 29. Immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they, with Jesus, came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. Look at this. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend praying, talking to Jesus for your friends, for family members? Think about that. I remember talking, um, I may have said this before, when I was working at Starbucks, sitting down at a 15 minute break, sitting down, I can't even remember her name. We both have a break at the same time when we're talking and she starts hearing through conversation all these places I've been to in the world. And I've traveled around, not as much as many, but more than a lot. And she's like, how in the world have you been able to go to all these places? And I told her, I said, honestly, um, almost all of them were mission trips. I was staying in hostels, <laughs> some places that were really hostile. And the reason I got to go on these exotic trips was for the sake of meeting people to speak Jesus to them, to share the gospel. I sacrificed a lot of sleep, a lot of energy. I had to work and save up money just so that I could go put myself in really uncomfortable situations to talk to people who usually spoke a different language. Why, why would I go to those links? She looked at me like I was from Mars. She's like, what? You did what to do what? I said that that is how important Jesus is to me. That is how important he is to me. And as we just read, when they find out Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever, what did they do? They went and spoke to Jesus about her, not gossiped. They went and talked with her about her. My mother-in-law is sick. Do you have friends and family who are not well? First and foremost, do you have friends and family who don't know Jesus, who is the perfect peace, who can bring comfort, who can save them out of the darkness in their lives or just the blindness. They don't realize what they're missing out. Some people are like, Jesus works for you, but I don't need him. I'm like, yeah, you say that just because you haven't met him yet. But once you meet him, you will change your mind. You'll think twice before you say that. And I've personally, guys, I'm posing this question to you. I'm convicted by it. Something that the Lord's been bringing up over and over in the last several months, I kid you not, is fasting. And he has been challenging me, Jake, spend some time talking to me, praying to me, just be with me. The time that you put into making meals and eating, stop. The time that you put into being on YouTube, scrolling through social media, put it down. We, we've all got FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. I can't turn this off. I can't step away from this. If I do, I'll miss out. What about all the people in our lives who are going to miss out because we won't get serious with Jesus about people that we know and love? Your faith, guys, might be the difference maker in someone else's life. Like, for example, Elijah the prophet. We read about it in 1 Kings 17, 19 through 24. I won't read it right now, but this woman comes to him who he's already had relate, uh, interactions with. And she's like, is this what your God's going to do? He's going to let my boy die. And you know what Elijah does? He comes over, puts himself over the boy, holds the boy and prays and does this three times. He's done praying, stands up. The boy doesn't come back to life. What does Elijah do? Walks back and forth, talking the whole time to the Lord. He doesn't stop. What if I say something to my friend or I say something, uh, I, I, I declare a bold claim about God in these people's eyes and they hear this and it doesn't come true. You know what I'm talking about. A lot of you have grown up in the church. You have had that question go through your mind. 
What if I do this and it doesn't happen? It doesn't come true. Will that make them not believe in God? And what will that do to my faith? Elijah didn't stop. He kept on praying. And then the boy came to life. It was faith, guys. Here's the kicker. It was faith in Jesus that saved this man's life. It wasn't intelligence. We confuse those two a lot, way too easily, and without even knowing it. Faith is not the same thing as intelligence. Now, you can be intelligent and have faith, but as we'll see, oftentimes those two compete because what we know, it just doesn't mesh up with something God is telling us or calling us to do. Yeah, but I know this God, and he's got, I know you know that. Do you trust what I know? Or are you going to lean on your own understanding? Are you going to acknowledge yourself in everything you do? Or are you going to bring everything to me and acknowledge me as the Lord of your life? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Do not depend on your own understanding. In everything, acknowledge him. That is to make him the Lord of your life. That doesn't mean saying a prayer, asking him to come into your heart so that you can go to church and have a clean conscience. That means, do you make Jesus the Lord of your life? Put it this way, master. Is he the master of my life? So that when I do something that I want to do, or it feels good, or it makes sense, and he goes, no, Jake, I don't want you to do that. Who am I going to obey? Who am I going to follow? Who am I literally going to trust in? What you obey is what masters your life. What things in your life do you obey? that aren't Jesus. Now look at verse six with me. Some of the scribes though, were sitting there and they're reasoning in their hearts. They're thinking about this. They're thinking about it. <laughs> they're feeling about it. It's all internal and there's major conflict going on. Why? This is a question and it's in their heads happening. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, look at verse 8, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? We see a man just moments before paralyzed by sin. Now we see men who are paralyzed by reason. This doesn't make sense to them. Think about it, guys. They just watched Jesus say this. By the way, Jesus has been doing this stuff. The reason these scribes are here is because news has gotten out. And some of these scribes, I would believe, have already seen Jesus do things that defy nature, what's normal, what's rational, what would make sense to the laws of physics. And they're in turmoil here, except these guys aren't paralyzed by sin from uh, something on the outside. They're paralyzed by their own intellect, the pride of their own reason. I remember having a student years back. Um, well, you guys all know Cherie Miller, right? Yeah. This isn't a story about Cherie. This is about a story about uh, a friend, kind of an acquaintance at school that she knew. And this guy was apparently really struggling and trying to find the truth, seek out what the real, real thing is. And she'd been taking time to reason with him about Jesus. She invited him to come to youth group. He and I met and we were talking. And uh, afterward, we go upstairs and I said, you know, I'd like to give you a book as a gift, but you do not have to take it. And I don't want you to take it unless you really intend to read it. Otherwise, it's yours. And it's a book... Um, Norman Geisler and Frank Turek called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Some of you have heard me talk about this book. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. He and I were talking. He said, honestly, I just cannot believe things that I can't see, that I can't feel, I can't measure. Like the universe, we know what it is based on science, right? Science. A lot of people put a lot of faith in science. Remember, science was created by people so already we know that there's a flaw there because people don't have perfect knowledge and understanding of everything. Science is an institution created by, instituted by men, actually the first ones in the Western world, Christians, who created the institute 
and study of science, Christian men, and the reason they wanted it, the reason they invented this, was so that they could better understand the created universe. We've gotten a long ways away from that. Sir Isaac Newton, a believer, disciple of Christ, wanted to better understand what God had made. Why? For this purpose, to better understand the one who made it. Just like when you get to know art, I remember taking an art history class. If you think history's boring, try taking history of art. I don't think history's boring, but that art class is like, oh, it's a new city. But you know what I started to learn? I'm like, I know that when I see these little marks or this little flaw, you could say, in this painting or this sculpture, I know that it's from this artist. They're signatures that reveal the character and personality of the artist. When you look at the created universe, you get to see God's personality on display. That's why scientists in the beginning studied this. It was to understand the God who made it, understanding who he is by what he's made. You could read more about that in Romans chapter one, starting at verse 18. But bringing it back here, I remember talking with a student and I said, so you only believe in things that you can see, touch, feel, measure, scientific, right? He's like, yeah. And I said, how much does love weigh? Define love for me. And of course he was trying to come up with, well, they're biological impulses. I'm like, you and I both know that's not true and you don't believe that. Love is not definable by metrics, by measurements, but all of us know that love is a real thing and a powerful thing. Where does it come from then? You can't define love based on the laws of nature. The natural laws of physics do not define, quantify, measure, or explain what love is. You're gonna to have to go beyond that. These guys here are paralyzed by reason. One of the greatest obstacles I've seen in my own life in trusting and knowing Jesus personally is our intellect, our reason. Even when we have very good reason to believe it, it just goes against what makes sense to me. So I can't accept it. And then we try and reason it away by saying it's unreasonable. Scribes, we're looking at scribes here, guys. These scribes knew what the scriptures had prophetically promised about the Messiah. They're watching scriptures unfold before their eyes. These guys, many of them had heard and seen the many supernatural signs that proved who Jesus was. Some of us are paralyzed by our sin. All of us at some point are paralyzed by our lack of faith. There are things that you do in your life that put up roadblocks, make life hard for you. But all of us, all of us have been paralyzed by a lack of faith. We know deep down inside, there's something that we can't see, can't feel, can't touch, that is more real than the world we see with our eyes. Faith in Jesus though isn't blind. I wanna make that really clear. I've heard that, you guys have heard that, right? Blind faith, well you gotta have blind faith. Um, I, I don't think so. I haven't read of anyone here who was blind. They saw Jesus and they saw the things he did. Faith in Jesus isn't blind. However, it does require us to go beyond what we already know. Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is the substance of things unseen the expectation of things hoped for, certain outcome, guys. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines what faith is. And faith is not blind. Faith is a certainty, but it cannot be quantified or measured by scientific metrics. Also, get this. Jesus had the power to know what the scribes were thinking. Jesus could read their thoughts, know their thoughts. How? Jesus was psychic. He was telepathic. <laughs> we talked about this already. <laughs> Sometimes Soren's questions are really believable, and then you find, ah, oh, he's just pulling my leg. So I was listening to a guy on a podcast named Joe Rogan. Interesting individual. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, interesting guy. 
and he had some people on his show and this one guy was relating when he was a kid about an experience, a very super abnormal, not natural experience that he had. And he taught, he said this of his friend's mom. He said, yeah, I knew this, uh, my friend, his mom was a Christian psychic. And I'm like, what? I'm not gonna tell you the whole story, but he had something pretty radical happen to him that night. And the next morning, he's talking with his friend and his friend goes, hey, are you okay? And he's like, well, yeah, why? My mom woke up at the same time, I think it was like three o'clock in the morning, woke up at the same time this guy had something happen to him. And he said, my mom woke up at three in the morning, really, really concerned for you and started praying. And so this guy thought that she was psychic. Aha, uh -huh. was Jesus psychic? You know, some people argue that he was. Well, he was telepathic. He was able to move things with his mind. Let's get this clear. Jesus is the word. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I'm going to say this right now because I was talking with the guys. I kind of let them chew on it. Jesus was not and is not psychic. Yes. Psychic, <laughs> being psychic calls upon and draws upon and depends upon the occult. Jesus in no way, shape, and form is involved in the occult. The occult at its root is demonic. And Jesus doesn't share the table with demons. And he doesn't depend on demons for power. That's psychic. And telepathic? No. But Jesus is the word of God. Can he read people's thoughts? Yes. But not because of occultic practices. Can he move things without touching them? Yeah. He created the universe just by speaking it. Jesus is the word of God. This is how powerful the word of God is. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. By the way, this isn't a poetic expression. He's being literal with this. What? Now, I'm not going to say this is a sword. But what he's describing is the real power that God's word really has. He says his word is piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. You have a soul and you have a spirit. They're not the same, but they're closely connected. Your soul is where your emotions come from. Like I've said before, the soul is how you decide what flavor of chocolate, or flavor of chocolate. There are multiple flavors of chocolate, but I've already given away what my soul decision is. Okay, Monica, what's a favorite ice cream that you like? Fla flavor? Um, mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. Yeah, sorry, Michael Scott just went through my head from the office. Mint chocolate chip. That's one of my son's favorite. Who here likes vanilla? Oh, I love vanilla. Oh, wow. I'm surprised. I thought vanilla was so lame until I had vanilla bean. Oh, uh, yeah. All you vanilla lovers are like, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Those are all soul things. The colors you like, the feelings you get, that's all from your soul. Your body is not who you are. It's what you wear. Any more than your clothes are who you are. They can represent you but that's not who you are. And be thankful for that. I'm 37. I don't look like I, yeah, th thanks, yeah. Ezra, yeah. <laughs> thanks, bro. <laughs> dur, dur, trucker hat. He goes on in Hebrews 4, he says, the word of God pierces as far as the division, can separate the soul and the spirit, can separate both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and even the intentions, the desires of the heart. There are things that you have desired You've had your parents ask you, why did you do that? And you're like, I don't know. Don't lie to me. No, I really don't know. Well, why'd you do it? I, I don't know. I confused myself. <laughs> I remember my dad asking me questions. Why did you do that? I don't know. And he thought I was being smart. I'm like, no, I, I really don't know. The desires of your heart, he can divide those with his word. Verse 13, here's the kicker. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Look at Mark chapter two with me. Verse 10, verse 10. So Jesus goes, which one do you think is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, pick up your pallet, get up and walk. Verse 10, he says, but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And the man got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, 
so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Can you imagine the guy who's crippled? He's like, I don't care if the scribes don't believe you. I believe you. Tell me to get up. Please tell me to get up. Tells him to get up. He, I can't imagine the guy picking up his pallet, looking at the scribes, being like, huh. He probably didn't walk away proud. But it's interesting. The scribes knew God's word better than most everybody else. And yet they had the hardest time oftentimes believing who Jesus was. Believing and taking his word. This is proof right here. What Jesus does, this is proof positive that Jesus has a unique authority and his nature is divine. Let me point out another thing. There's been something that's been growing. I remember when I was in Turkey on a mission trip um, and I uh, met a bunch of people and there was a gal that uh, I kept in touch through Google Chats. I don't think they even called it Google Chats back then. But her and I were chatting one day and I don't know how we got on the topic, but she was not joking. She's like, well, I believe I'm a goddess and I have divine nature. I'm like, okay. And you know what? Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, my mom called me by. And more and more people go, yeah, I believe in Jesus and his spirit's in me. And you're like, yeah, that's in the Bible. And so I'm God too. Whoa, whoa, hang on a second. I want to make something really clear, and you can see this throughout the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. Anytime someone is working a miracle, a true miracle, it's done in Jesus' name. You and I don't have the authority in our identity to do something miraculous. It can only be done in Jesus' name. I didn't say supernatural. There are things that happen that are supernatural that are not of God. But a real miracle can only be done in Jesus' name. Jesus uses a moniker. Look at verse 10 here. He says, but so that you may know that the son of man has authority. Son of man. It's a signature name, son of man. What does it mean? Because it comes up more than once. You're going to want to understand this. The first time the, the name son of man comes up, it's in Daniel chapter 7, 13. God gives Daniel a vision of the future after the Antichrist and his government have been destroyed. Most news these days in Christian circles are like, when does the Antichrist come? Daniel's like way beyond that. So here it is. After all that horrible stuff happens, Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. You guys know that Adolf Hitler was trying to create the, well, he had the Third Reich and he was trying to create a thousand year reign of rule. He was snagging that idea from someone else. Interesting. The son of man, by the way, according to Jewish thought, the son of man is, is who the scriptures call the Messiah. Messiah is also Christ. Same potato, potato, Messiah, Christ. It means anointed one. Now here's an interesting thing. This vision that Daniel has is a fulfillment of God's promises to the Son of God. We've seen the Son of Man and now the Son of God in Psalm 2, verse 6. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That's Jerusalem, specifically Mount Moriah. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Interesting language. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware, like clay pots. The scribes doubted who Jesus is, who Jesus was back then and who he is today. So you know what Jesus does to dispel all the doubt? He brings them back to the scriptures. They thought they understood it. He goes, okay, all right. So he says and does things that would remind the scribes when Jesus says something, we're like, wait a minute. That means Jesus says he's fulfilling this. Jesus takes their limited knowledge and then he expands it. Remember, I was talking about faith. Faith doesn't contradict logic, 
but it will take you beyond what you understand, what I know. Jesus expands their knowledge, takes them beyond what they already understood about who the Messiah is. So Jesus goes, you believe this man's disease is because of his sin. Jesus doesn't debate that with him. So Jesus goes, if this man's disease goes away, then that must be proof of my authority to forgive sin. You guys catch that? They believe this man was sick, paralytic because of sin. What did Jesus say? My son, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, you can't do that. And he goes, okay. So you connect his illness with his sin. Okay, I'll go with that. So that also means if he's well, and I did that, his sin must be forgiven. So what does Jesus do? Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And he does. They don't say anything. Jesus reasoned with these really intelligent men from their limited understanding. And this is what I think is incredible about Jesus. If I were Jesus, I'd be like, you're stupid. You're dumb. And this is why. He doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't condemn these guys. He doesn't put them down. You know what Jesus does? He confounds them with his compassion. Have you ever had an experience like that? Where people are making fun of someone else and they might make fun of you and then you do something that cares for this person that makes the crowd go silent. They just got no comeback for that. What Jesus does takes faith. He displays faith right there in front of them and they, they still can't get it. Jesus, get this guys, Jesus doesn't dismiss them for their disbelief. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, you're dumb, shun. Jesus doesn't shun them. He takes time to talk with these guys who ridicule him in their hearts. He doesn't dismiss them for their disbelief, but Jesus dumbfounds them with his divinity. He goes, all right, here I am. Here, here's who I am. You won't believe what I said? Believe what I do. Matter of fact, Jesus says that later on. You won't believe what I say, so then believe who I am by what I do. Look at verse 13. And this is where we end tonight. Jesus went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. Jesus came to reveal the truth, guys. He came to teach us. Jesus didn't come to entertain. That's why every week, and I know I can say this for Connie and Susan, honestly, the more the, every year that goes by, I'm amazed that as many of you show up. Because you know when Jake teaches, it's going to be at least an hour. And you show up. These people showed up to hear Jesus teach. Jesus didn't come to entertain. There are a lot of things, guys, that are distracting you. Knowledge distracts. There are a lot of people I know who love Jesus, went away to school, they got away from Jesus. Or, like I shared about my friend Paul, they get swept up in the immediate fun and pleasure of life away. There is so much entertainment that is distracting you and deceiving you with amusement. Jesus didn't come to amuse or entertain. Jesus came to teach us the way, the truth, and the life. Real life. Now, some accept Jesus' teaching, but a lot of people still don't. Did you know that the Bible is the most printed, prolific, and most spread book in all languages than any other printed book in the world, in all history? And still, a lot of people, for as much as God has revealed himself to humanity, a lot of people still won't accept his teaching. These scribes didn't refuse Jesus because, well... He's a blasphemer. He can't do what he, he says he does. He did it. Remember that guy? You guys have seen him on social media. Someone's making, they're, they're turning a, a task and, and making it really complicated. And that cuts from that. And the guy goes, yeah. right? Some dude's like trying to get out of a hole and he's like, Jesus is doing this left and right. What he does goes beyond what we can understand because it's unlike anything we've ever seen or do ourselves, but we cannot deny how true it is. People's rejection of Jesus as Lord and Savior isn't because Jesus is a liar. It's not because Jesus is a lunatic. 
Actually, people oftentimes reject Jesus because he is Lord. That means to accept Jesus' authority as the Son of God and the Son of Man is to give up your own authority of your own life. And we just don't want to do that. Right? That's hard. Check this out. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. So just to finish tonight, if you guys are paralyzed by sin, I want you to know something. If tonight, right now, you're stuck in sin and you can't move, he came to heal you. He came to forgive you, first of all. And he came to heal you and clean you so that you wouldn't stay stuck in that sin. What do I need to do? I, I got a student right now who says they need the Lord and they want, they want to be free. And I've tried to connect with them. And there's always a reason why we can't connect. How bad do we really want Jesus? These guys were so desperate, they took their buddy on a stretcher, climbed up on the roof, and dug a hole through a roof to bring him to Jesus. How desperate are we to be free from the things that hold us to sin? Now, here's the other part, like the scribes. If you are paralyzed by the pride of your reason and your intelligence, then you will never realize, you'll never realize who Jesus is. For all of our intelligence and ability to reason, if that is the reason you won't trust Jesus, then you'll never actually see him for who he is. I'm not gonna end with this passage because my time's up. But 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to read that tonight. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Basically, a spiritual person can appraise, value, understand all things, the natural and the supernatural. But the natural person who relies on their intelligence and their reason cannot understand spiritual things. So the question is, not how much do you want to know, who do you want to know? Because Jesus is the only one who gives true knowledge, real understanding. Let's go ahead and pray.